Hello, welcome to everyone to another capsule, IR capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. I'm sorry we missed a couple of classes because too many things were happening internationally and a lot of attention had to be given to those. But we'll catch up with that. The, the major uh, event that we have to cover is, as you all know, at the G20 summit in Delhi. It's already a few days, but it has allowed us this time to get a better understanding and appreciation of the situation at G20 because we are not only familiar with what happened at the summit, but also some follow-up things have happened that also we are able to cover. So as you know, the last one year was G20 festival in India. This is a very unusual thing in international diplomacy, particularly multilateral diplomacy. In my long years of experience with international conference, I've not seen anything like this. So I would say it's a summit like no other. The most important difference from the other summits I have seen is the role played by the host. Normally in international conferences in the UN and others, the role of the chairman is rather limited. His main responsibility is to make sure that the meeting is conducted properly, there is discipline, and there are also facilities available for everyone. And very often, the substance need not necessarily reflect the thinking of the host. In this particular case, what we did was, as soon as we took over from Indonesia, we started a new exercise of having many conferences. Normally, you have a preparatory committee in New York or somewhere else, prepare an agenda, decide on what should be discussed, and even on what the conclusion should be. And that is sent to the host country, and the host country calls a meeting of the foreign ministers, and then the summit. This is how it was done. But this time, we virtually reformed the multilateral, reformed multilateralism, because we gave it a new meaning and a new thrust. Uh, first and foremost, we held so many meetings in 60 cities in India and abroad. More than 100 meetings were held. In other words, we kept the G20 countries very busy, catching up with so many agenda items, which are normally dealt with only at the conference. And the first and foremost thing that India achieved by doing this was to project India's capabilities and India's possibilities not only to foreigners, but also our, ourselves, because many parts of India people were not aware of a conference of this nature. And therefore, they were all very surprised to see that the world had come to their village, as it were. And also, many people, uh, foreign delegates arrived, and they were uh, given a full view of India's cultural heritage, India's uh, culinary accomplishments or tourism and many others. So it was not just an international conference. It was virtually a festival of India in this last one year. And uh, the other delegations, of course, welcomed it and enjoyed themselves during these meetings. But on the substantive matters also, I think India took the lead. For example, the theme of the conference was decided by India, not anybody else. Asutaiva Kudumbakam was something that uh, we ourselves gave to the conference and one future idea, one earth. And that kind of theme was given. And it was generally accepted by everyone. It was only China, which raised some objection, asking, what is this Vasudhaiva Kudumbakam? We don't know. What do you say it in Chinese? Is a Sanskrit a language of the United Nations? All these rather childish questions they raised. And just to show that they have noticed what India is doing you know, taking over the leadership of the world, as it were. But even they went along with it in the final analysis. The uh, the theme was uh, accepted, and um, the, it was much of those ideas were incorporated into the declaration. And uh, so it was basically, the agenda was in accordance with uh, Prime Minister Modi's vision, and no one except China challenged it. The motto was also accepted. And um, not one of the, the declaration, uh, the leader's declaration included, included several ideas 
and phrases that were put forward by India. Even PM Modi's words to President Putin, today's era must not be a war. I have become part of the New Delhi leaders' declaration. So the whole world has accepted that notion that war should be avoided. This is not the time for war. And various decisions on economic matters also, in the paragraph, and not the, not the least, the paragraph on geopolitics. So inescapability of dealing with the war was recognized by India uh, right from the beginning and decided to do whatever is possible to get a consensus declaration. This is particularly because we could not get a consensus in the foreign ministers' meeting. In the foreign ministers' meeting, we tried to push the Indonesian formulation, where Russia was mentioned by name. But Russia had decided that they will not accept that under any circumstances. And it had China's strong support. And that was why there was some consideration as to whether an agreement would be reached on the geopolitics paragraph. Of course, geopolitics is not the main agenda of G20, as you all know. It is basically economic, social, and cultural matters. But everybody knew that in this particular situation where a war is waging in Europe for a year and a half, it was impossible to close our eyes to that. And so the logic used in order to introduce this item uh, was to, um, uh, you know, start from the very beginning with the realization that this is something we have to accomplish. And also because all the evils that are facing the developing countries arise from the war. So the connection between the war and the agenda um, was very well established right from the beginning. And we worked very hard on it because both sides, the West, the Russians on, and Chinese on the other hand, and the West on the other, were determined to uh, get what they wanted. Otherwise, they were not going to allow the G20 conference to succeed. But surprise all surprises, India was able to announce an agreement on the declaration, on what is called the leader's declaration, on the first day itself. Even before the lunch on the first day, Prime Minister broke the news uh, to the conference that uh, we have um, reached an agreement and this surprised everyone. And uh, when they saw it, they knew that this was the only option. And what, they, what India did was, of course, this was also approved by others, was to eliminate the name of Russia from the declaration because with that, it would not reach the consensus. We knew Russia and China would fight very hard. But the method was to select some sentences from the UN Charter, which are globally accepted principles. So we restated the principles without naming anybody, like, for example, non-aggression, uh, non-interference, internal affairs, integrity of country. These are all concepts which are recognized and propagated by the UN. These are words from the um, Charter, but uh, they were selected with the objective of giving the same signal, because everybody knew who we are talking about when we are talking about, uh, um, you know, the principles of the Charter. So the exhortations, these exhortations were to everybody, but it was very clear in the con context that this, these were addressed to the um, uh, Russians. So the Russians accepted the exhortations because the drafters offered them a reiterated reiteration of the national positions and resolutions adopted the UN Security Council. So first they gave the principles of the UN Charter. Then they included a sentence which would say that uh, it also takes into account all the exhortations offered in the UN Security Council and the resolutions adopted or discussed in the UN Security Council. So the, the UN Charter principles were made contemporary and that was the trick. So which means everybody who wanted to criticize Russia read it as though this is addressed to Russia, while Russia read it as though it is addressed to the whole world. So that was the that was the truck used. And it worked because there was no other way. 
And then an exception was also added. This is very interesting. That after coming to all these agreements, there is one sentence there. It says there were different views and assessments of the situation. So which means everybody is not really endorsing everything because they are recognizing that there were other uh, views. So while Russia was happy that the declaration did not mention uh, Russia, uh, like the president of uh, France said, the declaration is not a victory for Russia. So that was the so that was the compromise. So Russia thought it was a victory because their name was not mentioned, and the West thought it was a victory because all these principles and demanding of action uh, was uh, really essential. So the Delhi Declaration was more favorable to Russia, it is true, than the Bali Declaration because the uh, the accusation that Russia started the war is not there directly. So, uh, initially, the Bali Declaration was supposed to be uh, reiterated, but uh, naturally, because of the venue, because it was held in India, it had to be different. And um, this is what the foreign minister kept saying, that uh, uh, it's not possible for us to just copy the Bali Declaration. It had to be, this is India, and it should reflect India's position well. So, this is not going to make any impact on the ground situation we all know. Um, in fact, if anything, even during the war, during the conference, there were attacks and uh, drone attacks and various other things going on. And nobody expected that the conference will come up with a call for uh, ceasefire. Because ceasefire was not acceptable to either side. Uh, because uh, uh, ceasefire will mean, according to the Ukrainians, more time for Russia to regroup itself and Ukraine things that... Uh, Russia is about to lose, and therefore they did not give, want to give them time. Russia, on the other hand, felt that they were going to win, and therefore they did not want to give a gap uh, for Ukraine to gather arms and strengthen themselves. So both were uh, wanting to continue, and therefore this, this doesn't mean that there will be any uh, question as the war will continue. Uh, but uh, this was the best that we could uh, get. And um, so the, and then we, if we look at the other aspects of the declaration, the economic and commercial part, on various measures to improve connectivity and human centered developments on the basis of one earth, one family, and one future. This is the interpretation of Vasudhai Vakudumbakam, which was accepted and um, have been weaker without a position on, on the war. So the declaration, suppose it did not have anything on the war, the declaration would have been weak, so we accomplished both. So though G20 is not the platform to resolve geopolitical and security issues, but without a consensus on the war situation, the summit would have lost its credibility and relevance. And one of the most significant uh, development of the global of the summit in uh, Delhi was the emergence of what is called the Global South. Because even during the Cold War, when the East-West confrontation took place, at that time itself, there was a conflict between North and South also. North-South dialogue, and South-South dialogue, and North-South cooperation, all these were mentioned even at that time. So at that time, these points were made by the non-aligned movement on the one side, and there are some other developing countries which are not in the non-aligned movement were represented in G77. So there was a certain automaticity of uh, agreement between non-aligned and uh, G77. But here, the decisions of summit were taken with the participation of the North. So it is the South agenda for global south agenda which is uh, emphasized but it had the consent of the north that makes it a big difference and russia and china is part of uh, that exercise and therefore everybody as they say in multilateral diplomacy everybody is equally unhappy everybody is not happy that never happens in a conference like this 
So at least everybody has a, was a equally unhappy. So, but here the absence of President Xi of China was noticed because he had come, he had agreed to come earlier, but maybe he did not come. We don't know. Many people say there are very many reasons. The one reason might be uh, to uh, not to be a part of the coronation of India as the leader of uh, um, the Global South. They did not want to be part of it, as it has a dominating presence in BRICS. So they are focusing on the BRICS for the Global South, and they did not want to join uh, an exercise where India's prominence being re-established. But the, it is very clear that one building block of the new global order has been built. And that one building block is, as I said earlier, is the global south. Because it is not very clear who are in the global south, who will be the leader of it, who will articulate it, etc., etc., all open. And that might take some time. And the main rival to us in this case is China. And others also may not be so very happy uh, to uh, concede India's leadership. So later we discovered that even Canada is not very happy that India is doing so well. We'll come to that in our next uh, next capsule. So what we have done certainly is the uh, that we have built a block. Many more blocks are required to have a new global order. But one has been established. And what remains is to find the way to cement it together. After all the building blocks are done, then we need the mortar to pull it back together and then you get a global order. And one other claim that India is making is that India is responsible for getting the African Union as a member of G20 on the strength of the European Union being a, being a member. Because the European Union, it was done exceptionally because the uh, European Union acts as one country in various issues. And therefore, it was logical to bring European Union into it. But African Union is hardly an, a union. They are still fighting wars like Europeans used to do 400 years ago. And they are 400 years ago behind uh, an African Union. And therefore, it may not be possible for this includes, brings it to it, a whole continent. It brings in uh, more population, more wealth, more broad development. Uh, but uh, the establishing the bonds of among the countries in Africa will not be very easy because there are very many differences. Even on the question of the expansion of the uh, Security Council, Afghan, the African Union has not been agreed on one country or two countries. They want two countries, but they're likely to be one country, and nobody knows who that one country is. Nigeria wants it, Egypt wants it, South Africa wants it, I don't know how many others. So they are not able to put forward a candidate from Africa. And they are now talking about re rotating, etc. So, but a, a participation of African Union as a single unit will be effective, effective only if they are able to speak with one voice. So the membership of G20 will hopefully provide the incentive for the African Union to have a cohesive voice in world affairs without being exploited by China and others. But we have taken this initiative uh, basically to show our own uh, goodwill uh, and uh, our own uh, uh, interest in Africa. Africa had applied some time earlier, but people were not very willing to accept them as a union. And therefore, India took the, took the credit. So, and uh, therefore, we believe we have uh, received the goodwill and sympathy of the African countries. Next was, of course, the pursuit of sustainable development goals, the need to address the hopeless state of affairs of climate finance and the iniquities of the world belonging to the old agenda. And these have all been reiterated, basically the same thing, but it was lagging behind and that has been updated. In addition, there were several initiatives 
like digital public infrastructure, then uh, India Middle East Europe Connectivity Corridor, then uh, Biofuel Initiative, strengthening the global health architecture, closing of gender gaps and reform of the UN and international financial institutions. Such a long wish list. Here, of course, we have re-established the positions of the Global South and uh, the developed world has been urged to implement them because it is they who have to make resources available. So we hope that this, these agreements, they have also, they're also a party to it, not just a G77 or, um, or the Global South. There may be some, some progress, but um, uh, we have to see how this moves on to when, the, when Brazil takes over president. So there was um, some concern, of course, it always happens when Western leaders come to India that they will raise issues of uh, about uh, human rights situation in India. So uh, we expected this, but apparently they kept it uh, at the uh, you know, bilateral level and they did not raise it formally. Uh, President Biden said that it, he had raised the human rights issue PM Modi, but curiously the paragraph from one of the UNDA resolutions on religious tolerance and freedom found its way as paragraph 78. We do not know who suggested it. We do not know whether India had any objection to it. But it was no point in objecting because it was a general statement which we all agree. We agree that there should be no discrimination. We agree that there should be a democracy and human rights in all the member states. And that is what it says, this paragraph. So if we objected it in any form, people would say, oh, this is, India is... Uh, uh, showing that this hat you had uh, is you know is is theirs and we didn't want to claim that obviously and therefore this paragraph was uh, introduced it was a declaration it was a resolution of the general assembly which everybody had accepted so the indian delegation may have treated this as accepted language which applies to different situations and not specific to india but it may be quoted in future you may find Western delegations quoting this paragraph to say that India had also agreed to that. So the way India turned E20 into a year-long activity with innumerable meetings in different parts of India and abroad and managed to reach valuable conclusions on difficult issues has greatly enhanced India's prestige and stature. India has also showcased its remarkable achievements from reducing poverty to bringing light to the dark side of the moon. Prime Minister Modi's stellar performance and indefatigable energy were unanimously applauded by all. India's dream to be in the forefront of international politics has almost come true. India has placed itself firmly as a major player in the shaping of a new world order. So this is the briefest possible assessment or analysis of the G20 summit. I hope you will take note of all these aspects because in one way or the other, these are all going to figure in your examination because there are so many technical words here, so many concepts, and all these you will have to know very well when we write about or speak about it. And the story of G20 summit is not over the whole year till the Brazilian summit takes place. This will be the talk of the town. And, uh, and naturally, some questions will arise, as it has happened in the case of, uh, of Canada, totally unexpected. Uh, but this is to be expected, because when you re want to reshape the world, everybody is very, not very happy that it goes by the name of only India. They would all want to be uh, part of the, take part of the cake. So that is to be expected, but let's hope that uh, there is a new beginning of building a world order in which 125 countries as a block, as the um, global south is going to assert itself. Thank you very much.
think they are not formally a member of G20. I think so. I have not checked this. That may be. I never thought about this. And uh, it may be simply because they are not a member of the G20. Because there are non-members there, those are on specific invitation. We'll have to check this. But my feeling is Sahil was not there because of that. We we don't speak about normal policy anymore. In, the, in his most recent speech in the General Assembly, the Foreign Minister said that instead of being non-aligned, we are Sarva Mitra. That means we are friends of all. Not non-aligned, but aligned to everybody. So that is the new, new phraseology. And strategic autonomy, of course, is the basis of that. So we'll go by our own likes, our own thinking, and not being uh, pressurized by anybody. But at the same time, we'll take into account the interests of all and remain friendly to everyone. So it is a Sarva Mitra, a friends of all, is the new name for India. Thank you very much.